and, and pass over now to Marion. Good evening, everyone. Lovely to see you all, even despite the fact that we've had some pretty bad news about refugees this afternoon. Um, I'm Marion Pallister. I'm, I'm chair of Pax Christie Scotland. Uh, and being a peace organisation doesn't mean that we're soft and fluffy around the edges. When we see that the world's most vulnerable are at risk, we step in. And few are more vulnerable today than asylum seekers. In their home countries, they face discrimination at best, uh, death at worst. They may have seen their homes razed to the ground, loved ones killed. They may have experienced torture. There is certainly no future for them where they come from. They make the most difficult of journeys and then face the most hostile of environments in the place they seek refuge. The UK government has been particularly guilty of such hostility, although as we'll hear, there is hostility elsewhere too. On the World Day of Migrants and Refugees last year, Pope Francis said, all people must walk together without prejudice and without fear, drawing near to the most vulnerable migrants, refugees, displaced persons, victims of human trafficking and the abandoned. He asked that we build a more inclusive world which, inclu which excludes no one. So this event sets out to learn how we can build that inclusive world. But first let's reflect and pray with Hugh Foy, who is a member of uh, Pax Christie Scotland's board um, and welcome, welcome, Hugh. I'll hand over to you. Good evening, everyone. So maybe we can gather and take a, a pause just before we begin our deliberations. God of life, fill our hearts. Fill them with love and compassion that we might recognize your spirit in the refugee families seeking safety from violence, in the migrant workers bringing food to our tables, in the asylum seekers seeking justice for their families in the unaccompanied children traveling in a dangerous world. Give us hearts that break open whenever our brothers and sisters turn to us. Give us hearts that no longer ignore their voice in time of need. Give us eyes to recognize a moment of grace and not a threat. And give us voices that are raised in prophetic advocacy. Give us hands that reach out and welcome and minds that make an intentional commitment to work for a world of justice until all homelands are safe and secure. Amen. Thank you so much, Hugh. That puts us in the, the frame of mind to, to listen to our uh, speakers who are all uh, expert in this field. And I'd like to introduce first, Dr. Sophie Cartwright. Sophie is the Senior Policy Officer at the Jesuit Refugee Service UK, where she conducts research relating to immigration, detention, forced migration, and the asylum system. She's also a research associate at the Centre for Criminology. 
She's no stranger to Scotland, having previously worked with people seeking asylum in Glasgow. And she has an academic background in theology. I'm hoping that she'll explain the effects on asylum seekers of the Borders and Nationality Act and this deportation to Rwanda situation. Sophie, thank you. I'll hand over to you now. Thank you very much. Yeah, hi everyone, it's good to be here. Um, uh, I'm going to attempt to uh, share my screen as there are some slides. So let's hope that this works. Uh, yeah. Uh, can everyone see the slides? Not yet. No. One moment. Jeez. There we are. Great. Thank you. Um, so just to let you know uh, a bit about where I'm coming from, uh, JRS works with refugees and other forcibly displaced people in um, around 50 countries worldwide. In the UK, we have a special ministry to people who have been made destitute by the asylum system, um, to people held in immigration detention, and more recently also to people um, placed at the asylum camp uh, at Napier Barracks in Kent. And just, I'm going to mainly focus on uh, new and forthcoming changes to the asylum system, but to briefly um, contextualize it, You'll probably be aware that refugees who arrive in the UK on their own steam have to navigate a really grueling process before the government will recognise their need for protection. They routinely face suspicion and disbelief, with the people who are deciding on their claims typically looking for reasons to refuse them. And whilst waiting for a decision, people are banned from working or claiming benefits, and for asylum support, they have to live on. Um, approximately well, just over five pounds a day. Um, often asylum support can be difficult to access. Um, the asylum process is very unfair. Um, about 40% of um, initial refusals get overturned on appeal, just to, to, to give an example. Um, once people are refused and appeal rights are exhausted, they are completely destitute um, and um, very vulnerable to exploitation, and they're also at increased risk of detention. Um, immigration detention in the UK is, as you might be aware, incarceration without time limit in prison-like conditions, um, and it happens by a, an administrative decision um, of a civil servant, basically. Um, it, and it's a really very traumatic and grueling experience for people. It has a really long-term impact on them even after a release. So this is clearly a very hostile environment. Um, and again, as, as you're probably aware, the government has a policy of creating a hostile environment for people refused asylum and other people with precarious immigration status um, with ostensibly the intention of making them uh, leave the UK. This plays out in a matrix of policies and legislation designed to make life here unbearable for them. Um, it criminalizes for them many daily activities like driving and working um, and it puts in place barriers to various services um, and it operates by co-opting uh, a range of public bodies and private individuals, the DVLA, private landlords, um, and getting them to give migrants data to the Home Office. Um, so in that sense, it breaks down relationships of trust. Uh, it, invades communities, it, it tries to make it so that there's nowhere to turn. Um, and um, it, this operates alongside wider hostility in the asylum process. Um, repeatedly, the refugees that we work with tell us how dehumanizing this all is. You know, people are forced to flee their homes uh, and they came here for sanctuary and instead they're re-traumatized. I remember one person uh, describing to me their experience of being uh, in immigration detention and they said, you go somewhere where you think it's safe, and they put you through the same process. They don't have to put you in detention, 
but they put you back in the same situation. Putting someone in detention is a kind of torture. This is someone who had, in fact, already survived torture, um, speaking on this. So that is just a, a, a bit of background to, to appreciate the context into which the um, Nationality and Borders Act and New Plan for Immigration are already entering. Um, now, the, these the, do represent a major overhaul of the asylum system that is underway. Um, so I think the new plan for immigration um, was announced back in March 2021. Um, and to orchestrate it, there are a lot of changes in both policy and law. Um, at the heart is, of course, the Nationality and Borders Act, um, which uh, 2022, which was recently passed. Um, I have to keep remembering to call it an act, not a bill, and it's a, a bit depressing every time. Um, and really, the plan and the act try to make it as hard as possible for people to get sanctuary in the UK, uh, and they build on aspects, uh, the, the most hostile aspects of the existing policies uh, to imagine further cruelty. Um, let's go over some of the key points. It would not, of course, be possible to cover them all now. Um, first, refugees will be punished for how they travel to the UK uh, and present themselves to the authorities, um, wh whether they are considered to have done so in the first possible opportunity, for example. Um, so how is this going to work? Well, it, it is already starting to happen, and it, and it works on um, a number of different levels. Um, first of all, there are barriers to even claiming asylum if you've arrived via another country without documentation or both. Um, uh, and this is actually, you'll see where, where the Rwanda, um, the horrifying forced flight to Rwanda comes in, among other things. Um, so uh, a really key barrier to claiming asylum is the inadmissibility rules. Um, these were introduced uh, as policy rather than law at the start of 2021. Um, and they say that if someone's traveled via a, a purportedly safe country, or uh, really rather ambiguously has a connection to a safe country, um, the government will try to rule their claim inadmissible. That is, they will try to say, we don't even have to look at your claim, um, whether you need protection is, is not relevant to us, um, and what we need to do is get another country any other country to um, take responsibility for it instead. Um, this uh, creates, of course, a logistical problem for the government that's cruel enough to enact it because it's not possible to remove someone to a country that hasn't agreed to take them. Um, the government um, says that what they're going to do in response is to send inadmissible people to Rwanda. Um, now, this is, of course, a deeply cruel and dangerous plan. Um, it's important to be clear that this isn't offshore processing. That's been talked about a lot in the asylum, um, in the new plan for immigration and, and conversations surrounding it as well. But this isn't um, a situation where people have their claims examined in Rwanda and then if they're found to be refugees brought back, we're talking about permanent forcible relocation. Um, this is horrendous. Uh, it is likely to prove logistically and le legally difficult. Um, so uh, this isn't the, the only thing that's going to be happening here, although it will be causing fear. It's already causing fear among so many people that, that we work with um, uh, and, and therefore affecting everybody in the asylum system and many beyond. Um, but, but in other cases um, where people don't get sent to Rwanda, what will happen? Well, um, now we see differential treatment of refugees, which is a key clause in the Nationality and Borders Act. Um, this divides people um, recognized as refugees into groups one and groups two. If you've traveled via another country, arrived without documents or don't claim asylum and what appears to be the earliest opportunity, 
Um, this will mean that you have fewer rights and protections, even if and when the government agrees to examine your claim, and then, having done so, acknowledges, yes, you are a refugee, and we are obliged to provide you with protection. Even under these circumstances, refugees uh, who traveled via another country but, um, or entered without documents or um, didn't claim asylum instantaneously um, will find it very, very difficult, in many cases impossible, to um, reunite with family here. Uh, already the family reunion rights are very restrictive, um, but they will probably be virtually non-existent. Um, this interacts with a few other pieces of family law, so um, I still won't tell exactly how much. Um, and they will have no right to settle in the UK. Um, the the uh, policies that's laid out at the moment is that after two and a half years, the government will try to remove people again. Um, this will force people to continue living in a painful limbo, um, in fear, and it uh, denies them, of course, any chance to rebuild their lives. Um, it's really important to be clear when thinking about this that most people seeking sanctuary have no choice in how they travel at all. Um, relatively few come to Britain. They have fairly clear reasons for doing so, like family ties. Um, and furthermore, there are no safe and and as, as the government would put it, um, no safe and legal routes for the vast majority of refugees. Um, even if there were more, which there should be, there wouldn't be a sufficient solution um, because it's not always possible to get to an embassy to, to gather your documents um, uh, when, when you're um, fleeing for your life. If you look at think of scenes in Kabul, people are uh, desperately clinging to planes to get out. Um, but um, there is something particularly dishonest um, about punishing people for not using um, safe routes that don't exist. This is to ignore people, the, the, the right reality of forced migration. Indeed, it is to punish people for the reality of forced migration and to abandon the principle of international protection. Um, so that's punishing refugees uh, for how they travel um, uh, here. Next, um, moving on uh, to um, asylum accommodation. Going forward, it is likely that asylum seekers will increasingly be housed in institutional accommodation, in um, basic reception centres, to quote the new plan for immigration, while waiting for an answer on their claims. Um, these are being trialled at Napier, um, and the government is on the point of opening a new centre in Yorkshire. Um, I'm very pleased to say it's encountered some resistance. Um, so JRS supports people in Napier, as I've mentioned, um, and I've been there several times, and it really, it, it really is bleak. Um, the, these barracks were disused for a reason, for one thing, they're, they're very run down. Um, it is prison-like, um, with high walls, security guards, and, and it um, is very removed from the community. Um, people really struggle to get access to lawyers there. And um, what our team has noticed is that people's mental health really deteriorates markedly over the period of time that they're there. Um, even if they uh, were outgoing and cheerful before they, they would join to themselves. Um, and and a, a lot of people talk to us um, about not, not really feeling human while they're there, they, they kind of lose a part of themselves. This is actually comparable in, in some ways to, to what um, how people have described attention to us. Um, uh, there's a there's a quote there in, in the slide um, that, that someone that was very has come very kindly said that, that we could share with them. Um, and this whole approach, of course, is um, opposed to, to any, anything based on integration. It, it doesn't allow asylum seekers to participate in communities or to build wider social bonds, and and this is really ghettoizing. Um, at the same time, this is not uh, something that's happening instead of detention. Um, we are likely to see uh, more use of formal immigration detention. Um, 
This was announced by the Prime Minister in a speech in Parliament in April, um, and it goes hand in hand with inadmissibility processes that will have people held in limbo for a long time, um, attempts successful and unsuccessful to uh, remove people to Rwanda. Um, there's also um, in the Nationality and Borders Act provision for examining more asylum claims uh, in detention, um, sort of re, uh, re resurrecting the um, detention fast track system uh, that, that detain people immediately on claiming the asylum, this one is slightly different, uh, and then um, rushing, um, rushing them through to refusal. Um, and it was ruled so unfair um, that it was uh, deemed, deemed illegal. Um, that's uh, there. Um, the, the example of someone that, that we worked with um, who, who was subjected to this and sharing a slide of. Um, so we've got um, alongside a number of uh, really worrying things happening in asylum determination and in the kinds of uh, rights the refugees will have, um, the, the landscape of the asylum and uh, uh, system and uh, uh, detention state is changing such such that um, life here in the UK, whilst people trying to, to gain recognition as refugees, um, will be um, even more painful than it currently is. Um, this is this is a very brief overview of the situation facing refugees across the UK. Um, I could say more, but I'm conscious of time. Um, and I believe that later, uh, one of our other speakers will have some thoughts on how to respond and how to actually uh, campaign for something that's better. But um, thank you very much, everyone. Um, Thank you very much, Sophie. I'm wondering if Marion is with us. There we are. That, Sophie, I'm sorry, my uh, internet connection is not good, so my apologies to everybody. Um, but that was such a valuable insight into today's situation. Could I remind you that uh, we will have that uh, question and answer session at the end. And as Callum said, if, if you do put your questions into the chat as we go, or if you like me, you'll forget something really important that you want to raise. I would now like to introduce Brendan Woodhouse. Brendan is a refugee rescue activist and speedboat driver for Sea Watch, which is a, a non-government organization rescuing refugees in the central Mediterranean Sea. He's also a firefighter, and in May, he received the Solidarity Medal from the Fire Brigades Union for his life-saving work with refugees in the Mediterranean. So we're gonna hear about that work and, and I hope also a poem that uh, he's written, which I find deeply moving. Uh, Brendan, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. Um, and thank you for everyone for listening to this because it's, um, these are really hard times at the moment. The news today is um, completely crushing to anybody that cares about human beings to anybody that's worked in this sector, to anybody that's met the people that are involved and God knows how the people involved feel as well. It's important that we collectively stand together, understand what's happening and oppose what is an utterly racist and abhorrent decision today. Um, I've I'm going to talk a little bit about what's happened over the last few years in, with regards to sea rescue. Um, I, if I'm honest, I'm a little bit I'm a little bit crushed by what's happened today. So I'm 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 not really as enthusiastic as 
as I would like to be, but um, I'll try to use it as a, a foil in my fervor of speaking about it. And I started doing the refugee rescue work in 2015. I've been on, uh, I've been on ten, 10 missions with Sea Watch so far, I've been part of the rescue of getting towards eight and a half thousand people. Um, and then um, I've seen how European and, and as, as well as British um, hostility has, has grown over the, over the last few years, because it's not just us, it's Europe as well. It's right the way across, it's, it's America with Trump, it's all over the place. Um, and um, in 2015, when I first started doing this, we had uh, Operation Mary Nostrum, which was a military and Coast Guard operation that was designed to set up to rescue refugees from the sea. It was run predominantly by Italy and Malta. Now, in 2015, what, hap what, the result what happened was that they had Coast Guard boats, they had naval boats, all deployed in the, in the sea. Um, they were rescuing people. Um, it wasn't perfect. It wasn't great. They weren't doing everything by by good human humanitarian standards, but they were there, and they were saving lives, and that was the mission. Um, and I remember in two thousand and sixteen arriving and um, finding such a, such an all, god awful state, and. I, uh, what I want to do is I want to constantly talk about the real humanity that's involved here. I'm just going to talk about one little girl that died in my hands out there that, that, that week. She, we were, I was called to a boat, I was a medic. I was previously being a combat medic with the British Army and I was a medic on that boat. And I was called to, called to the other speedboat for a woman that had gone unconscious. We got there and it wasn't a woman, it was a girl. Um, Brought her onto the speedboat, quickly got onto, onto an Italian warship and I started CPR. I remember the greyness of the the whole the deck of the ship, and I remember her, her, the brownness of her eyes. I remember the reflection of the blue sky in her eyes as I tried to force an airway into past her teeth. I wasn't able to save her. And I remember a body being taken away by a helicopter. Now, I, look, I remember looking at her. She was 14, 15, or 16 years old. And I went to the, I went to the, went to the boat where she'd come from because we wanted to find a family to let her know. Nobody knew who she was. Nobody knew her name. Nobody knew where she'd come from. They just knew that she was there. Things like this are happening in the central Mediterranean all the time. This, this, is, this is my point. This is the, the real human beings. These are real, these are real kids that are drowning in the Mediterranean. And what has our government's been, reaction been to that? Well, in 2017, they showed us, the Italian authorities pushed it mainly, but the British, British are just as involved. And, and all of the European Union are complicit in it. We changed our policy, got rid of the, the, the imperative to rescue. And we changed our policy and took all the new, all the rescue boats away. All the Coast Guard, all the Navy ships left in 2017. Now, since 2017, 24,000 people have drowned in that sea, including 5,000 children. Um, the narrative that people use all of the time is that these are fighting age males. And it's really deliberate, deliberate, frightening, narrative they wouldn't be scared if they said they were school kids and they wouldn't be scared if they were said they were workers either they're using the using really deliberately hostile frightening terminology for people that are essentially really frightened themselves they then started to criminalize the, the rescuers and every single ship that's been out there has been import, uh, de, uh, impounded and investigated including the ship the ships that i've been on um, in 2019, the ship that I was on, Sea Watch 3, we were impounded after rescuing 47 people. Um, we were impounded off the coast of Sicily. Um, we were all investigated. I was threatened with a 22-year prison sentence for facilitating illegal migration when I just drove a speedboat and pulled people out of the water. The hostility that, is, that we were facing 
it, well, it wasn't directed at us. This is to frighten us away from refugees. This is to frighten us away from rescuing essentially what is what is brown and white, uh, brown and black children and people. Because this is what it is. They're, they're trying to keep you white. And the, the far right elements within Europe are the ones that are pushing it. And the rest of the centre and the left are far too scared to, are too scared to stand up to them where we need to because what's happening is is abhorrent in 2019 we signed the uk government this government right boris johnson was a foreign secretary and he flew to libya to sign off a deal to re forcibly return people against their will to libya in the same way that what we're it's it, we're not forcibly returning people to rwanda we're deporting them to rwanda but there we, we agreed that we were going to send them to a country that we knew wasn't safe, that we knew was in civil war, that knew, we knew were, that had a history of, of sla uh, slavery, where the people that were being captured, ca captured at sea and returned by the Libyan Coast Guard, we know that they're being tortured on their, on their return. They're being beaten by the guards, being held in detention against their will, they're not being put on trial, and then they're being sold to mafia. Now these mafia are catching people, and I'm going to talk a little. Really, at the end, I'm going to talk about a bit. I've, I've written a book, you see, about a guy called Doro, and Doro, his story really encapsulates all of this. Um, and and the, the fundraiser for publishing that is, has been released today, and I'll I'll share that in the group later. Um, but um, they are forcibly returning people, knowing that they're going to be retorted in ransom video calls to their parents. What happened to Doro was exactly that. He was tortured. They cut him from here to here and they opened up his cheek so that this mother on the video call could see inside as they demanded a ransom from her, which of course she paid. They didn't let him go. They left him for dead and he escaped. Now this, that, that side of the story is not unique. And now we were meeting people. The last mission I went on was in April, just this year. And some of the people that we'd rescued had been, at the, it was a fourth, fifth, sixth time of trying to, the, 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 the argument to say that they're returning them to, to Libya and they, 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 that we're stopping them from coming isn't true. It's, it's, a, it, it's a complete fallacy. What they're returning them to is to more torture, more detention, more smuggling. The more smugglers make more, more work, the more, and, and to organ harvesting, all these kind of awful things. And then, the futility of it is that so many of them will just get back on the boats and try over and over and over again until they either die in the sea, they die in Libya, or they die in a detention centre. Um, one of the things I think about often when I look at these boats is, would we stand for this if there were white people? And the answer I've come to is uncertainly no. Marion said I was going to uh, share a poem. It takes me, I, I don't know how long I've been talking for, so I'm going to start reading that poem now. It takes me just a couple of minutes. Um, I wrote this poem as part of an acceptance speech to the Fire Brigade Union who wanted to recognise the rescue work that I've done. Man, they, they want to recognise me for the work, work we've done. And people call, it, call us the rescuers all the time. They, they say, and when when, I, when the newspapers want to speak to me, they want to always want to make a story about about this guy, this white guy who goes out and rescues people, this firefighter that goes and do, does it. But the real people, the real heroes, are the people like Dovo, who, who the story is about. This is my poem. It's designed to shake up some feathers. It's designed to make people feel uncomfortable. It's designed to hit people with white fragility issues, and I hope that it does. If they were white, if they were white. If they were white, there'd be no need for these speeches and no sucking leeches, no deaths on our beaches, no idiot preachers spitting words that aren't true, like they come from a zoo, like they've escaped and they're dangerous. There would be such a change in us. We'd see it with clarity. If only we lived in a world with race parity. If they were white, there'd be no need for rescue. They'd just get on a plane, speak out their name, We'd, speak, we'd treat them the same as though they came from Ukraine. We wouldn't allow them to drown in our sea if they looked like me. We'd open the gates to the walls that we built. We'd see it's a sin to do anything other than just let them in. If they were white, there'd be no deals with Rwanda. 
Pretty Patel would see it just like Uganda. With Idi Amin, we just let them in. There'd be no deportations to faraway nations. There'd be no wave machines. It has become so routine to treat frightened people so incredibly mean. And every time without fail that the prime minister fails, you will see it splashed on the front of the mail. Look, the refugee boat has set sail. If they were white, they'd still be alive. Samuel, who died in my hands, in front, right in front of me, in April, would still be alive if they were white. If they were white, can you imagine that all of a sudden the papers went silent and nothing was said? Do you think that they'd never mention the dead? Can you imagine if those faces were pale? What would they say in that rag Daily Mail? Do you think they'd print words like cockroaches? Or maybe they'd hire buses and coaches? If they were white, if they were white, if they were white, there'd be no need for the drownings, no Daily Mail frownings. We build bridges, not walls, and the names that they're called all would fall. There'd be none at all. There'd be boats and planes to whisk them away to a place where they're safe, and people would meet them, wholeheartedly greet them. If they were white, they'd be allowed to work and no one would smirk, saying that they're here for a massive fake benefit system that just isn't true, but it's, spe it's, spe it's sticking like glue because it's repeated over and over and over again. Each and every one of them, they all have a name, but we've allowed their names to be numbers and the numbers are high. And 24,000 people have died, 24,000 mothers have cried. So say it out loud for those that didn't survive. If they were white, if they were white. Thank you. I think I think I'll probably be out of time now. Thank you. Brendan, I don't hardly know what to say, but I say thank you. Um, I'm so glad that I asked you to come on this. Um, I hope you stay safe and I hope you go on to write many more poems and books that will move people to think again about the world refugee and migrant situation. Could I now introduce Sabir Zazai, who has been Chief Executive of the Scottish Refugee Council since 2017. He was previously um, CEO of, of Coventry Refugee and Migrant Centre. Sabir arrived in the UK from Afghanistan in 1999, and his work draws from his own experiences and expertise in community integration and cohesion and refugee rights. He graduated from Coventry University with a master's in community cohesion management and was awarded an honor honorary doctorate from the University of Glasgow and the Lord Provost Award for Human Rights. He is honorary president uh, of City of Sanctuary and a visiting practice fellow at I think I think we lost Marion there. Uh, I, I don't need such a long introduction, especially after uh, Brendan's uh, moving uh, input. Uh, I think I must admit that I've I even forgot what I'm going to say, having listened to Brendan and his courage uh, and tenacity in trying to help and support people uh, in their journeys from war, poverty, uh, persecution, and human rights violations to safety, and also people who are denied the right to be safe. Uh, so, Brendan, um, I take my hat off and I shake your hand as a former refugee, and thank you for all that you do, but also for these really powerful words. Um, if I had one minute for my presentation or a very very little time to say what i'm going to say is that it was december 99 and i was in the back of a lorry with many other 
men, women and children en route to the UK to seek safety from the conflict in Afghanistan. I arrived on a on a grey day in the in, in Dover and and I was then um, displaced uh, sorry I was then dispersed to um, to Coventry where uh, I sought protection and uh, and I lived and worked in Coventry as Marion said before moving to Scotland to join the Scottish Refugee Council but ladies and gentlemen I took that journey and today I'm proud to be the CEO of Scottish Refugee Council. It was thanks to the investment and the welcome of people like yourselves. But let's bear in mind that had I arrived today, had I arrived today or this week uh, or last week in which I was honored with an OBE, instead of that OBE, I would have been put on a plane and sent to Rwanda. So people that are sent to Rwanda, they're people like me. They're people like you. They're people with family, with friends, with hopes, aspirations, and dreams. They're after safety and protection, nothing else. Nothing like this government has been telling us. These people are seeking protection and majority of them as Sophie said and also in Brendan's talk as well are people who are entitled who are refugees and majority have valid cases to seek asylum here it is a responsibility of this country of the United Kingdom to look on each cases on its own merit Sadly, we're moving into a regime that will put people on a plane to Rwanda without giving due regard to each case or each person. And let's not be fooled by the fact that this plan is only for young, single, fit men arriving in boats. I was a young, fit man arrived in the back of a lorry. But you don't have to be a young, fit man and also not be vulnerable as well. I was vulnerable, I was fleeing the Taliban. And today as well, we have young fit men, women and children who are fleeing the Taliban, who are fleeing Syria, who are fleeing Ukraine, and who are fleeing Eritrea and Tigray and many other places. People don't have the option which route they take. People don't have the opportunity to pick up their papers or even pick up their elderly family members with them or bring their whole families i come from a large family i couldn't put everyone in the back of a lorry to come here and i myself arriving was enough of a, a pain and a journey but just imagine if i'd arrived with a large family as well so all these things to say that this plan is only for a specific group of people is not right i've asked categorically off the Home Office at senior level to say, does this plan include women and children? And their response has been that this plan is for people who are inadmissible, as Sufi said. So you could be a woman and be inadmissible. You could be a child and be inadmissible. So they've not categorically said that they will not include women and children in this plan to be sent to Rwanda. So where we are at the moment is that I think, in my opinion, as a, as a former refugee, but also having worked with other people seeking protection, I think this is an extremely worrying and critical time in the history of asylum in this country. And it needs to be a moment of reckoning for us. It's not just about who we let let in and not let in. It's about the kind of country we want to be. Do we want to be cruel or compassionate? And that is a big question in this. So it's not just about a number of people being sent to Rwanda or people denied the right to seek asylum. It's what we want to be and what kind of society we want to leave for our future generations. The Rwanda plan for me 
as a member of the refugee communities, he is not only aimed at those who are inadmissible. It has made life difficult for all of us with a refugee background. Sadly, the policy is not only aimed at those that it is talking about. It is making the rest of us who have got a refugee background feel very unwelcome and undervalued as second class citizens. I've had people with British citizenship who've come as refugees in the past, as I did, WhatsApping me and sending me messages, being worried about their future here. This policy is dreadful to its core, and it is aimed at dividing us. It's not aimed at making anything better for this country. It will be a shameful stain on our reputation on our history and traditions of offering a hand of friendship to people like myself who are seeking sanctuary here. It is going to cost, and it's so ironic as well, that not long ago, last October, here in Glasgow, in my current home, we had world leaders who gathered as part of COP26 to deal with the world's climate crisis. But it's the same leaders including our leader here, Boris Johnson, who will introduce asylum and immigration policies that will move us away from the refugee convention that has protected refugees for over 75 years. And we cannot look after our world without looking after its people. So there is so much irony. And also Brendan mentioned Ukraine and Ukraine reminds us how soon life could change for people overnight. And it, it tells us the TV screens, the images that we see, it does remind us. We don't need any further reminders. I think we've heard about Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, and other places, but this is the closest reminder to us as to how lives could change overnight. But Ukraine also reminds us the love, compassion, and hospitality of our communities, people trying to help and support refugees. And this could have been a moment for this government to use that hospitality and welcome and that upswelling of public generosity towards Ukraine refugees, but extended to other refugees as well. This government could have united us. And this could have been a moment for the UK to be introduced as a place of sanctuary to everyone seeking protection. But sadly, very sadly, this government is taking a different approach, a very hostile approach under its immigration uh, nationality and borders uh, act now, but also the Rwanda plan by sending people to, uh, to places as far as Rwanda, where they have no connections. But let's not also forget the fact that the Nationality and Borders Act has got a number of other divisive, uh, divisive approaches in it. For example, uh, people who, who are children of refugees could be sent to places where their parents came from for their crime. They will not be treated as British criminals. They'll be treated as criminals of places that they have no connections with. So people will be deprived of their citizenship, their right to citizenship, simply because of where their parents came from. So in every aspect of this bill and also this plan, sadly, there are signs of racism and discrimination. And we need to make sure that we stand up to it and continue our fight, no matter what the court decided today, no matter what the government will decide tomorrow. The hope and power is in our hands. It's the people that can change the course of government. Look at Australia. And Australia was coming, was, was taking similar approach to sending people to islands that they had no contact and no connections with and locking them away. But today, that shift in attitude there happened because of years of people like yourselves campaigning and working together to remind the government that their policy 
and their regressive approach to people seeking protection is not in their name. And we need to continue that fight. We need to continue. We will have days where we have not had much gain, but this is not about winning or losing. This is about continuing to fight for decency. And the fight for decency and human rights is not one that has got a, a target. It's a longer term journey. Human rights and decency is not given to people overnight. It takes many years and many efforts for people to restore dignity and confidence and, and safety for people who are seeking protection. So my uh, advice for us to continue this work is to, first of all, making sure that if you haven't, if you haven't signed up to Together with Refugees, I'm proud to be chairing the Together with Refugees campaign, which currently has 450 organizations signed up. So please do sign up there and you will be updated on, on our next plan of uh, campaigns. Uh, in Scotland, uh, we have the Refugee Festival next week. So it starts next week and then it carries on for a couple of weeks. There's over 100 programmes of activities across Scotland celebrating the richness that refugees have brought to Scotland over generations. We must tell positive stories of how refugees and members of local communities live side by side. We must celebrate positive contributions. We must tell a different story of a United Kingdom and Scotland here, um, as opposed to the regressive and cruel and inhumane asylum policies. Uh, and across the UK, there will be Refugee, Fe uh, Refugee Week. So make sure you attend to, to as many events that you can to make friends, to reconnect with people and to celebrate we must continue to, to give that positive image of refugees because sadly this government and the media has continued to, um, to stigmatize refugees and scapegoat them for their own political gains. Um, the City of Sanctuary was uh, mentioned in my intro. Um, again, uh, it's, a, it's a great initiative. If you've got your own local City of Sanctuary group, then brilliant. Do join that and and uh, uh, and continue supporting the local initiatives. Uh, if you haven't got a local city of sanctuary group, uh, I'm sure city of sanctuary group and my colleagues could help you to set up your own own group and uh, uh, and try to have your own network to meet together to see what you can do to help and support refugees. Uh, write to your MPs if you come across particular concerns and issues. Uh, it's important that you write to your MPs uh, uh, and, and keep them updated on positive and negative aspects of uh, whatever this plan and the Nationality and Borders Act will now bring. Uh, uh, and, 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 and more directly on the plan, write to the airlines. Tell them what they're doing is not in our name. It's inhumane. They're trading human beings. We stopped doing that a long time ago. We cannot restart it by trading refugees with other nations. So write to the airlines, name and shame them, because this is a battle for all of us. A letter from you rather than a refugee might land better with some of these people. I mean, it's very, very important that a group of us get together and write a letter and individually as well, it's very important that these airlines are flagged. And at the beginning, I'm grateful to, um, uh, to the colleague who, who offered a prayer. Refugees need your prayer. Please think about them and bear them in mind. We are all from somewhere. We're all a family. We're all connected in that important and powerful bond of humanity. Sadly, we have a government on a mission to divide us, and we must stop them. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Goodness me, um, what speakers we've got tonight, eh? Uh, and you have certainly enriched uh, this country, Sabir. So th thank you. Thank you for all that you've said this evening. And um, I, I have no idea where I've 
been dropping out and coming back in again, but I've put some stuff in the in the chat uh, that I hope will will say uh, what I, I want to say to both uh, Brendan and to yourself. Um, Pax Christie Scotland will certainly be uh, following your advice as uh, as an organisation and hopefully as the individuals who are with us tonight and our membership in general. Uh, I'm going to hand over now, thank you all three speakers. Um, there are some, lots of questions and, and comments in the, the chat. I'm going to hand over to Callum uh, to guide us through a question and answer situation. So over to you, Callum, thank you. Thanks, Marion. I'm going to start just by bringing our, our speakers back on screen. Um, and I mean, really, where, where to begin? Where to begin after such a powerful evening? And it seems, I don't want to say well-timed because I think that's the, the wrong sentiment, but it, it seems fortuitous that we've got the opportunity to be together, to gather, to pray together, um, and, and to reflect on what you have shared with us tonight, Sophie, Brendan, Sabir, um, on such a, a, a sad, uh, on such a, a, a tragic day when we're reflecting on this particular issue of refugees. But you've all emphasised something that I think is incredibly important, and that's what can we do next? And I want to turn to that very issue in the chat, because one of the first questions we had tonight was, what is the next legal route? What can be done next? Do you see any sign of hope in terms of the legal process next? And perhaps, um, Sophie, I can come to you <laughs> with that question. I don't know if we have Sophie. Sabir, perhaps I can turn to you for that. that yes, question. sorry, I was coughing here so yeah uh, I think uh, the hope is that um, some of our legal colleagues might be in a position to um, pursue individual um, claims uh, because as I said um, uh, every refugee is unique in terms of their journey sadly the government is coming up with this plan of putting people in one of these reception centers doing a quick decision on them so that they can prove them inadmissible and then putting them on a plane. So these this reception, asylum reception centers that have been popping up, like for example, the one in Linton on News, will be like a, a machinery that will sort of like quick decision people out of your love and compassion and out of the legal sector as well, and then prepare it, them for their flight to, to Rwanda or elsewhere. So um, what, would help is uh, if uh, our legal colleagues could um, would intervene and and, uh, and and challenge the government on individual cases. And the more cases we win individually, the more it will prove that this plan is um, uh, illegal. Uh, well, it is illegal, but I think we need to we need to highlight more individual cases where. Um, the, this plan is putting lives at risk and is denying people uh, who have every right to seek protection uh, that, that opportunity to for their case to be heard. Um, I wouldn't be surprised that there will be some really powerful examples and particularly examples of uh, uh, people uh, from Afghanistan uh, because the, the, the regime changed in Afghanistan in August last year. The UK government committed to bring over 20,000 people on a resettlement route. Uh, sadly, it has not delivered on that uh, commitment. It's counting the people who were evacuated towards that number, which basically the UK is saying we don't have anything else to do with Afghanistan. But over 27,000 people alone worked in Helmand with the British Armed Forces. So if tomorrow, a woman with two children who lost her husband because he fought, fought with British Armed Forces in Helmand, arrived in Dover with her two children, off her own back. This plan will, and this asylum uh, and uh, current uh, uh, Nationality and Borders Act, will make her inadmissible. And 
th those kind of cases where people had involvement and their p lives were, were put at risk because of our involvement in Afghanistan. And that will create a, a much greater challenge for, uh, for, for the government. So I wouldn't be surprised that even now there are people lined up to, to be sent to Rwanda from Afghanistan. Who, who who fled because their because of their involvement either with the UK or UK companies. Uh, so apologies for yeah, I've got three enthusiastic kids in the background, so it just shows yeah we all have our lives as well. But uh, yeah, sorry for that long-winded answer there. Thank no, you. Not at all. Thank you, Sophie. If I can maybe focus again on that legal issue, um, we're being asked: Is there then some kind of mechanism? to take forward that human rights argument legally? Is there a recourse now to challenge the government again in court or has that option been exhausted? Um, uh, uh, I, I didn't um, hear that the first uh, time, time that the, um, the, the question was put, so apologies if I misunderstood it slightly. Um, I would say, um, it's essentially, no, it hasn't been exhausted. Um, there, there will be um, a number of, uh, of, of of legal challenges ahead, um, specifically if, if we are looking at um, Rwanda. I believe someone in the, the chat um, function asked about um, taking uh, taking um, the Nationality and Borders Act to um, the, the, the to international courts. Um, uh, it, that's that's that could possibly happen with. It depends on the the issue at hand, but it, um, really, um, there are there are a number of different issues. So, um, for example, some things could, could be taken to the ECHR. Um, uh, I was I was talking earlier about um, reduced family reunion rights, um, and uh, Sabir has has mentioned sort of how. People often are not able, even uh, if after a huge amount of effort, are able to get here themselves. They're not been able to take all their family with them. So this really is important. Um, that's um, one of the things I think uh, that is likely to be um, potentially fought out at, at um, the, the European Court of Human Rights. Um, but it, it's it's difficult to know. There are a lot of options. Um, uh, for different bits of the legislation. Um, and um, in the abstract, it, it's quite difficult to work out exactly how they're gonna play out. I think that that, honestly, that, that is one avenue that, that we need to we need to pursue and we need to keep challenging on. Um, and it, it, needs to, it needs to be accompanied by um, other, other forms of, of solidarity, of challenge and, and of attempts to, to, to build um, a counterculturally hospitable um, and supportive environment. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I hope that helps to answer the question. Absolutely, thank you, Sophie. Now, Brendan, I, I hope you get an opportunity to see in the chat area the the many, many messages. Um, your poem really struck a chord. I think that's an understatement. So, thank you for sharing that with us. I, I wonder if if you might consider this question, Brendan, what, what do you see as the government's rationale, if we can even call it that, for their current position, um, both in a political sense and in a legal sense, I suppose? Okay, I, I want to kind of touch on a little bit of the last question first, but it's okay. Thank you for all the kind words, by the way. The, the people were talking about, uh, about legal challenges and things like this. Um, this is all good. I think that's part. That's one part of what we should be doing. But I think it's it's really time that that we got out of our comfort zones. It's time that we were prepared to take solidarity actions ourselves. I'm not. I don't want to incite riot, of course. But um, you know, the Stansted Eleven. I've got friends that were that 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 took out their got went out of their comfort zone to lie in front of aeroplanes to stop them stop them taking off the, the in scotland you've got a you've got a proud history where you've where you've got people turning up deportation centers uh, deportations to stop the deportations there was one in peckham yesterday where people solidarity movements people like yourselves 
turned up at these events and went out of their comfort zones. Um, sometimes acting um, within the constraints of the law and sometimes putting themselves right in the policeman's way. I think that's the time that, we, that we're at now, that we need to be able to consider what we, what we do. That isn't a legal challenge. That's what we do as individuals. Forget the lawyers, let them do that. We've got responsibility ourselves to act. And that comes from small acts of solidarity from joining the local refugee groups to sharing things on Twitter, to meeting refugees and befriending them, to, um, to, to large acts where you, where, you, where you go overseas and help. You know, you don't have to do refugee rescue. You could, you could help with Care for Calais. There's whole, so many ways to get involved in this. Sitting behind our computer screens and hoping that the legal system is going to resolve this, for me, it's just not enough. Um, your question was around why or, or um, why do I feel that our government is doing this? Our government is trying to divide us in order to rule us, and that's really clear for me. Um, they know that there is um, that the easiest thing for them to do. And I've covered it in the poem. The look, a refugee boat has set sail. Every single time the five prime minister fails, that's what they do. Every single time that they, they're in trouble, they point at refugees because they know that, that that creates a noise and a distraction away from them. But it's also a vote winner. They're appealing to people who are disenfranchised, feel lost in their communities, that don't understand them. This is part of our responsibility of activism too, to p speak to people that around us, to speak to friends that we know are opposed to us being silent on this is no longer an option it's no longer enough it's no longer enough to hope, hope that they just see things right it's time to reach into the communities into your friendship groups into your families and tell your uncle bill or your auntie sue or your cousin fred say look i know you think this but look what's happening to, to these people find examples human examples are really important find those examples that that's that will reach into them um our government wants to divide us on race. They want a culture war because they know that those people that are disenfranchised within our communities will back them. They'll find that as an easy vote winner. They'll find that as an easy way to, to, to beat down on the human, humanitarian effort that, and, and the, good, the good thinking people in, in our communities. And, also, and it's also a, a, a degradation policy, not just against the people that are involved in, uh, in the, the, the refugee support sectors, not just in terms of the legal challenges, but most importantly, is to degrade and dehumanize the people that are coming. It's to belittle them and to make them feel inferior. It's to beat them down over and over and over again, and to make them feel like they're not safe, they're not welcome to come here. Um, which is why it's so important that the other side of this is the activism that comes from that to make make sure that people bloody well do feel welcome, that people don't that people don't feel afraid, and that they know that our, their communities when they go to when, when people go to deport them that their communities will turn up en masse to stop the deportations. It's incredibly powerful, Brendan, and it, it does, it presents a challenge to us all to, to step outside the comfort zone, and I think there's, there's a lot there to, to consider and to think about practical steps and you know, how we go forward, maybe come back to that in a moment. Sabir, in the meantime, I, I want to ask you a question around the, the detention centres around the camp. Um, Anne asks, you know, if you were to go into a prison, you would see medical facilities, educational suites, chaplaincy going on. Does any of that happen in, in a detention camp? Is that something that's available readily? Well, um, well, I, I don't know if things have changed now, but when I was put in a, in a place uh, when I first arrived, uh, I, I don't think there was much of that kind of support. I didn't know anyone from any faith group to be there to speak to us. It was more or less people from the home office and uh, they would be asking us questions. They were more interested in how we arrived, why we arrived and uh, what we wanted to do. Or, or uh, and, uh, and it was all done through interpreters. So um, uh, I've not been to a detention center recently, whether whether the, that support is in place or not. 
um, but I, I, I will be surprised if, if, it, if it was, I don't know if other colleagues might be closer to this, but sadly we have uh, uh, an asylum system for many years uh, which is aimed at reducing anything that will be seen as a pull factor, even if that is an, a, a Home Office official smiling at someone or offering them a welcome. So anything that would would be deemed as a pull factor, I don't know if that, that would be included in, in, in that support. So um, I'd be surprised, but I don't know. Uh, I, I, I think there is quite a bit of promise about this place in uh, Lenten on use in terms of uh, uh, what facilities and support might be there. But again, um, uh, I've, it's now being contracted to Serco, I think. Uh, all happened very quickly, so I'm not keeping my hopes high on that one, given our experiences here in Glasgow with Serco, where they were trying to use... Uh, stop lock change eviction as a method to get get people out of their asylum accommodation which we challenged and we were able to to win over them which yeah so so i won't be keeping hopes very high but i think there is there is a lot more than that that needs to be done in terms of like um yeah uh, pushing back on this i think brendan is right uh, this is one moment where our rights and our things that we've taken for for granted and for gifted after the Second World War, our rights, our human rights, our dignity, um, our right to offer protection to our fellow human beings have all been at risk at the moment. I think we need to, we need to communicate that to the government, to, through the media and others, uh, because sadly the picture that the government is drawing is that the public is fed up with people arriving in small boats. No, the public is not fed up, I think, is the government playing its own game. Friends, I'm, I'm conscious of, of time for the, the Q&A, so I wonder if I can ask each of you to, to maybe say a word in, in closing, perhaps. Brendan, you've challenged us very clearly to, to have listened actively tonight and to go forward and actually do something. And so if I were to ask each of you to sum up in maybe one practical step what we could go forward and do, however challenging, however far it takes us out of our comfort zone, but one practical step that we could take following tonight, can I ask what it would be? And Sophie, I'll start with yourself. Um, I'm, I'm going to, to, to give two. Um, uh, the the first um, is um, to to write um, to, to your MP uh, and and to your MSP to to tell them um, that you um, firstly oppose the Nationality and Borders Act. Uh, the, what the MSP can do about this is obviously different, but but um, and engage them on the subject of, of a welcoming um, asylum system. Uh, Relevant in Scotland at the moment as this conversation about dispersal, incidentally, um, like relevant as specifically to, to devolved government. Um, uh, and the um, second, a bit what Brendan was saying, someone you know, hopefully someone you're close to who maybe isn't, isn't sold on a welcoming environment for refugees, who thinks the hostile environment has a point. Um, Challenge them, have a conversation with them, like a human conversation, um, but a bit of challenging one. Um, try and see if you can change their mind. Thank you, Sophie. Sabir? Uh, I think it wouldn't be fair to say one thing is enough to help people in such a dire situation. Um, uh, I think, first of all, I think there is something that needs to be done around opinions. This isn't about refugees. There's no us and them. Refugee rights are our rights. I think we need to look at it from that perspective. And, and we need to make sure that we see these as our rights. Our rights for safety, our rights for dignity and protection. Not just as refugee rights. They're human rights and they're universal. And 
uh, and I think with that, I think we need to, um, all of us have the responsibility to to write to to the government, to the prime minister, to through our MPs and, and through other channels to tell the government and the Home Office about solutions because what the Home Secretary shamefully has been saying is that there are no alternatives. Well, I can list a few if, you, if I have a moment. We could have a better and quicker asylum decision making. There are 100,000 people in the asylum system, not because 100,000 people arrived. These 100,000 people have been left in limbo for many years, months. And if we made quicker decisions, or even in light of Ukraine, if we gave those people, 100,000 people, an amnesty, because we know what their needs are, we know them in terms of security. We know why they're seeking protection. That would have created 100,000 spaces within our asylum system. Annually, we receive 24 to 25,000 asylum applications. Within that system, we would have had 75,000 places for Ukrainians as well to be supported in asylum accommodation. What has happened now is that we've kept people, 100,000 people in the asylum system in limbo, and we're asking the public to open their doors to Ukrainians. Now that's not right. And it's the government's responsibility to help Ukrainians and other refugees as well. But sadly, because we've got that blockage in the system, it has created a situation where the government cannot cope with Ukraine and is asking the public to play part. Um, we need to have easier family reunion rules. So somebody like me, like if my dad arrived tomorrow, he's stuck in Afghanistan, he will be put on a plane to Rwanda. And that is absolutely heart-wrenching for me to know that my father, who risked everything to get me to safety, if he arrived in Dover, because there's no other way for him to to seek protection here in the UK. And some of you might even know that he was even refused a visitor's visa a few years ago to come and join me at my graduation ceremony. If he arrived, he will be put on the plane to Rwanda. And that is not right. We need to have better family reunion rules. We need to invest in integration. We need to collaborate with France, not with Rwanda. We need to involved lived experiences of people who've gone through the asylum system to design a better, more humane, compassionate and efficient asylum system. We need global leadership. We need international aid to address root causes of forced migration. And we need to make sure that there is efficiency in the asylum system and that, that no asylum decisions are delayed more than a month or a couple of months, but not for people to be in the system. I know people who are in the system for up to 10 years, and that is not right. Thank you. Well, thank you, Sabir. And lastly, Brendan. There's a phrase in the Bible. Whatsoever you do for the least of my brothers, that you do unto me. It's, it's a well-known What's not so well known is whatever, whatever you don't do for me, at least for my brothers, that you don't do for me. This is a time when we all need to remember that. It's a call to action by Jesus Christ himself. The most important person on a rescue ship isn't the speedboat driver, it isn't the captain, it's a photographer. The photographer provides the witness and provides the voice. The, pe the people who change things aren't speedboat drivers or the rescuers. Tomorrow we'll have, to we'll have to save another one and another one and the next day the same until the political ch landscape changes. We need a political change. That's the most important thing that we need in this world right now. And it's not, well, not much to ask, is it? To write to an MP. It's not much to ask to donate to the charities that are involved in helping the political landscape change, such as, such as Care for Calais. Care for Calais is a massively important organisation. It changes the political landscape and it challenges the legal frameworks that are happening at the moment. The, the, the people that were in court today were funded by, by three big organisations. Care for Calais was one of them. 
um, we can all get involved in that in that challenge of what's happening through our pockets, through our letters. And when we see it happening on our doorsteps, we need to step out. Thank you, Sophie. Thank you, Sabir. Thank you, Brendan. I, I really cannot thank you enough for sharing with us tonight, for the conversation that we've had and for the, the challenge that you've quite rightly set out tonight. Um, please, God, that we have the courage to, to take that challenge up. I'm going to hand back over now to Marion. Perhaps we can come back to Marion and I'll hand over now to Hugh, who's going to lead us in a, a closing prayer. Again, just to add my thanks to our three speakers who have really helped us to understand and encouraged and motivated us towards action this evening. Lord God, as we end our gathering this evening, Help us to remember those who tonight will go to sleep unfed and unwelcome strangers in foreign lands. People who have fled for their lives and are far from their homes. We lift up to you those who are escaping persecution and conflict having fled death, torture, and ruthless exploitation. So many carry wounds, mental and physical. So many have suffered greatly. Place in the hearts of all gathered here and in our communities, your compassion for their plight. Soften the hearts, and open the minds of those blinded to the oppression our brothers and sisters face. We pray for an end to wars, poverty and human rights abuses that drive people to become refugees from countries that are victims of an oppressive global political and economic system rooted in greed and power domination. We give thanks for all those working to ease the pain and suffering of refugees. We ask for your blessing that we might bring life, dignity and hope to the new communities created when strangers become friends in a new land. We see in all of the human family a reflection of the divine unity that is made manifest in all migrants journeying in hope to you, our true home, where every tear will be wiped away and we are at peace, safe in your embrace. Amen. Thank you all so much. Thank you for to our speakers, to Hugh, to everyone who's been with us tonight asking questions. Let's get out there now and act as we've been asked to act. And uh, I think that uh, everyone at Pax Christie Scotland will be taking that advice. You're all absolutely wonderful and I know that you'll do what we've been asked to do so take care and good night thank you